now my Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour, stay Thou nearby. Temptations lost their power when Thou art nigh. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour. Enjoy your pain. Come quickly and abide, or life is vain. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to Thee. Teach me thy will and thy rich promises in me fulfill. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to Thee, O oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to morning. I'm not surprised the organ tried to die. It's been one of those weeks. Why not end with fireworks? <clears throat> All right, here's your interesting fact for the day, although I have nothing to do with amazing facts. They estimate that in the United States, 99% of homes have a television. 96% of homes have a flushing toilet. 99% have televisions. 96% have flushing toilets. I'm going to assume that all of you have a flushing toilet. And I do realize they don't all work the same, but most of them work on the principle that the water goes around as it goes down. I'm not going to ask if your toilet works that way. It's not important. Today's message is a promo for a series, short series I'm going to be doing for you in October called Thriving in the Darkness. And the intro today is the flushing toilet around but down. We live in a world that is both changing and not changing. Do you know what the Bible says the skeptics are going to say near the end of time? It says the skeptics are going to say, in the last days, walking according to their own lust, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. 
Nothing's changing. Life's just going around and around and around. People get born, people live, people die. Nothing changes. That's what the skeptics are going to say. Somebody sent me a video last week that someone had sent to them, and I, I debated whether or not I was going to share it. I just decided not to. But the, the video was from an Adventist person, and they were basically warning us that things are imminent and things are dangerous and things are scary, and you really should do something about it. How many of you who are over the age of 70 have been hearing for your whole lifetime that we as Adventists were on the very edge and the world's going to end and you weren't sure when you were young if you'd ever have, get married, ever have children, you certainly weren't going to retire. How many over 70 went through that experience as a Seventh-day Adventist? See? we're still here. And the skeptics will say, everything is continuing as it always has been. Where is the promise of his coming? It's just not going to happen. Do you think it's going to happen? Do you really think that literally someday the sky is going to split and Jesus is going to come? What should we be doing about that? That's the question. Now, if you've been paying attention to a verse that I pay a lot of attention to, it's in Ecclesiastes. I read it for you last week. The things that have been will be what's been done before will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Without further ado, where are we and what should we be doing as Seventh-day Adventists in the world in which we live? Well, first of all, I want to show you some cultural changes of the recent past. By no way is this a comprehensive list. <clears throat> 75, 80 years ago, guess what percentage of Canadians live in rural areas as opposed to living in the city? Very close, I heard 75. It's close. 80%. 80% of Canadians lived in what was considered rural areas 75 years ago. Guess what percentage live in what we consider rural areas in Canada today? 80%? 20%. 33 million Canadians, only 20% of them live in what we consider to be Rural areas. Literally, it has flipped completely. Now, was there ever a day in Canadian history where all the people in the country woke up one morning and said, en masse, it's time to go to the city? Was there ever a day where that happened? No. So what happened? What happened? How did we get from 20% city livers to now 80%? City livers. How did that happen? I heard it. Gradually. Danielle turned 13, 12 plus. Not 13. It's a bad word. She turned 12 plus in August. I still remember when I could hold her, her head would be in the palm of my hand and her feet were at my elbow. Didn't seem that long ago. But the strangest thing is, every day... She's the same. How does that work? Every day she's the same, but she went from having her head in the palm of my hand, her feet in my elbow, to now it's getting hard to lift her up. How'd that happen? She grew up eventually, a little bit like that. 
All things continue on as they always have been. And yet everything is changing all the time. All right, so without spending a whole lot of time, divorce and marriage and gay marriage and all those issues, tattoos, media explosion, race relations in America, women's rights, rise in diseases, cancer, Alzheimer's, AIDS, diabetes, etc., etc. <clears throat> I want to focus on tattoos for a minute. Picking on the older crowd again. How many of the older crowd remember that tattoos were a rare thing? And if you had one, you were like a sailor or a drunk or some kind of crazy person. <laughs> and now, if you don't have a tattoo, you're some kind of prude or religious nut or something. Something wrong with it. Everybody has to have a tattoo. Or three or ten. Or... How bad? Did everybody in Canada or the United States wake up one day in 1999 and say, you know what? Let's all get tattoos. It happened gradually, but I want to talk to you briefly about something called the tipping point. Books have been written about it. It's a very real phenomenon. It happens in business, it happens in life, it happens in all kinds of areas. The tipping point is when enough people buy into something that it causes everybody else to buy into it en masse. They say that roughly the population breaks down into 15%, 70%, and 15%. So 15% of people are the movers and shakers, the pioneers. They will do stuff that nobody else is doing, and they don't care if you do it or not. They're just going to be their own person. 70% of people are watching the trends, and they move when something becomes popular. And the other 15%, they're like, they dug in, and they have a trench and a bunker, and you can move and shift and do whatever you want. They are not moving. Tattoos have long passed the tipping point. It's not a discussion anymore if they're good, bad, right, wrong, whatever. Everybody has one. And if you don't have one, whatever. It's just this. All right, I hope you can see the bottom there. If it seems like I'm jumping around, bear with me. It's all going to come together. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. My wife hates one word, so I won't, it's the top, we'll call it the titler. Cycle. So this guy has studied the rise and fall of nations, and he has discovered that there is a pattern. Nations rise, and they grow and then they decline and they fall apart in a cycle. So a nation will come out of bondage, though they want freedom, they want a new life, they want something better, and so a group of people will move from one place to another place. And usually it involves faith. It's people who believe that they're, they can have a better life, there's a better way. It may be religious faith, it may be some other kind of faith, but they move and they start something new. Now the belief along with the belief, requires courage. Not only do I believe that it can happen, but I have to have the courage that it can happen, to make the moves necessary to make it happen. And once you have the faith and the courage, you move, and when you move, you move from bondage into liberty. And in that liberty, you find success and abundance. And from that abundance comes selfishness, and from the selfishness comes complacency, and from complacency comes apathy. And apathy moves to dependence, and dependence leads back to bondage. Now, if you studied American history or Canadian history, and you look at this wheel, where do you think we are? I've heard complacency. I've heard apathy. We'll come back to the wheel. All right, we are quickly going to go through the history of the Israelite people. They were a people in bondage, but they believed that they could be free. And so the journey began with Moses at a burning bush that was burning but not burning, and God said, Moses, it's time to go get my people. 
set them free. So Moses marches up to Pharaoh. We're going very quickly through the story, obviously, and leaving out a lot of details. And Moses says to Pharaoh, what do you say? Let my, let my people go. <clears throat> they left. They came to the Red Sea. They were trapped. Moses holds up his arms as God instructs him. And what happens to the sea? It opens. They march through on dry ground. When they get to the other side, Moses puts down his arms on the other side, and what happens? Water comes sweeping back in and swallows up the Egyptian army. So they proceed into the wilderness. They come to Sinai. God speaks to them from the mountain. And then Moses goes up the mountain, and he gets the Ten Commandments. He comes back down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments, and what does he find? He finds the golden calf and the crazy things they're doing there, and he smashes the tablets of stone. They recover from that, God gives them a new set, and they build the sanctuary, and they spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness as a result of their sin and unbelief, and finally a new generation comes along who believes, and they cross the Jordan into Canaan. First city they conquer is Jericho. And the spies that go into Jericho to check it out meet a woman named Rahab. Now I want to pause here because while this is unfolding, time is passing by. My father and I were in Walmart this week, and he went to the CD section, which already betrays his age. <laughs> and he purchased music that was relevant to his youth and the time that music was important to him. And time changed, and music changed. And what I want you to get today is a concept that you are living in a moment in time. But things have already happened before we ever showed up. Things are happening as we live. And things will continue to happen, regardless of where we are on the spectrum. Now, Rahab was a prostitute, which means she probably was a fairly young person. And when she speaks to the spies, she says, We know what your God has done for you, how he brought you out of Egypt, how you crossed the sea on dry ground. And she recounts verbatim all the things that God has done for them, which she wasn't there to see, nor was she probably even alive for some of it. But she's aware. And I want you to understand that the, you may not have lived through some history, but you are need to be aware. I remember being shocked to the bottom of my feet and the top of my head and the ends of my fingers when I sat in a Sabbath school class with a couple of 14, 15 year olds and I referenced Hitler and the Holocaust. And as soon as I made the reference, I looked at them and I realized... They don't have any idea what I'm talking about. No clue. So I had to back up, tell the story, and then proceed forward. And you will find all through the Bible, God recounting history. It was in our scripture reading. Joshua recounted their history, and he said, Now that we've been through all of this, I'm choosing to stay with God. What do you choose? So Rahab was not an Israelite, didn't experience any of those things, wasn't alive for some of them, but she was fully aware of what God had done. If you are not aware of what God has done in history, you better brush up on your history. So we fast forward, they're living in Canaan, they've crossed the Jordan, and they're conquering the land, and Joshua's life is passing, and he's coming to the end of his life, and he gets the people together and he says God has done all these things for us but there's still a problem 
The problem is God has done all of these things and He has brought us into the land He promised to bring us into, but some of you, yea, many of you, are still serving the gods He rescued you from. Some of you are still living with one foot with God and one foot where He took you from. You physically move from one place to another, but mentally you are still in Egypt. And Joshua gathers them and says, you need to choose. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, the very next book of the Bible is the book of Judges. For those of you who don't understand, and you need to understand, you say, well, this is relevant to me, this is 2015, what do I care about what happened in Judges, with Joshua, with Moses, completely irrelevant. Well, you can think that, but it's really not. Because those who are ignorant of history are bound to repeat it. So Moses was the leader of the people, he led in tandem with Joshua, then Joshua took over, and he led, and then Joshua died, and there was a series of leaders after that referred to as judges. It was a system Moses had actually established while he was still living. He divided up the people into groups of people, and he put judges over smaller groups of people. So the book of Judges is called Judges because it's the era of Israelite history where they were ruled by judges, not by Moses, not by Joshua, and neither by a king. It was the in-between period where the judges ruled them. The book of Judges covers a span of about 300 years. You say, well, why is that relevant? Because it's about the same span of time that we've been in America, as nation, Canada, and the U.S. And it chronicles the events that happened between when Joshua died and when the nation essentially fell apart. And if you're paying attention at all, North America is falling apart. It is. Whether you want to say it is, whether you want to put your head in sand and pretend it isn't, it is. So what would be smart of us to go back and find out what happened back there that made them fall apart? So that I can figure out what I need to do in my nation while it falls apart. That's why I call the series Thriving in the Darkness. We cannot stop the darkness, but we can survive the darkness. We can even thrive in the darkness. The problem with Seventh-day Adventists is we've been telling people to be afraid for over a hundred years. Smarten up because bad things are going to happen. Get with the program. Is that what Jesus said when he came? Be afraid? Smarten up because bad things are going to happen? Or did he say, come and follow me? Don't be afraid. Be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. It's my desire for you to have life and to have it more abundantly. Some people say Judges is about the tragedy of our hearts, and it is. Some people say it's about the broken people and a faithful God, and that's certainly true. But I say Judges is the book of the flushing toilet. And I say it's the book of the flushing toilet because his people are going around and around in circles, but as they're going around, everything's going down. So there's the circle of going down they went through. They had peace, and they served the Lord, and then they did evil things, and God punished them, and then they became enslaved, and then God would raise up a, a conqueror. Or they, sorry, they would cry out. You can't see at the bottom. They would cry out to God in their enslavement. God would raise up a judge or a conqueror, and God, they would be delivered, and then they would be successful, and then they, they would have peace, and then they would go back to doing evil, and it went around and around and around. But the whole time it was going around, it was going... Down. Looks kind of similar, right? 
Now, I asked you at the beginning, where do you think we are in the circle? I heard complacency. I heard apathy. Now, I'm going to venture way out on a limb this morning. I am not a political, political activist by any stretch of the wildest imagination. I'm not interested in telling you how to vote. However, every political party has an underlying philosophy that governs how they think the world should run. So we have three basic parties in Canada. You, and I'm just going to tell you their platforms and then you can decide. So the Conservatives believe every man for himself. That if you want to get ahead, then get ahead. But do it on your own. The government's not here to pass you out checks. They're not here to coddle you and take care of you. We'll, we'll, we'll set up things that make success easier, but you need to do your own thing. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the NDP party. And their philosophy is we exist for the people. We're going to create programs that make it better for the people. We're here to take care of the people. We're all about the people. The money that comes to them to take care of the people comes from the taxes, which come from the, the people. So if the people think they can do nothing while well, the government takes care of them, how's that going to work? So I'm going to sit home and collect a check and do nothing, because the government doesn't take care of you. The government says, well, we would love to take care of you. That's our whole philosophy, but we need money to do that. Where's it going to come from? And then you have the Liberal Party in the middle, which says, we're all for the people, and we, you need to do some stuff, and we're going to kind of play the the middle. Now if you look at the circle, courage, which party would say you need to go out and make things happen, be your own person? Dependence. Now I just came from the east. And the NDP have way more influence there than they have here, although you just voted in a... I have no idea how that happened. Actually, you've actually voted more conservative than you voted NDP, but the conservatives split the vote and whatever. Anyways, I'm not here to talk politics. <clears throat> what I can tell you is that the, the kids that are coming up, they see government, the role of government, to take care of the people, to be the parents for the people. That's how they're thinking. What's that going to lead to? Dependence leads to bondage. Now you led them into that because the generation that exists right now, my generation, the generation that preceded me, was, were generations of complacency and apathy. We can't do anything about it anyway, so whatever happens, happens. That was our generation. So the younger generation says, you know what, if we can't make anything happen, then someone needs to take care of us. All right, enough bad news. Here's the good news. So if you slept through the rest of it, you can wake up now. It's good news time. By the way, this is a quote from Ellen White. Imagine. The person that we use to, use to share bad news. The short, the person we abuse, I should say. The shortness of time is frequently urged as an incentive for seeking righteousness and making Christ our friend. Now, this appeals to human nature. Right? You go to the doctor and the doctor says, look, man, you've got to smarten up or you're going to die. Oh, well, I better smarten up then. And you smarten up for a little while until you start to feel better. And then, the shortness of time is frequently urged as an incentive for seeking righteousness and making Christ our friend. This should not be the great motive with us. Imagine, Seventh-day Adventists should not be motivated by the shortness of time. 
Does that fly in the face of everything you've ever heard of the Seventh-day Adventist? Come on. We should not be motivated by the shortness of time, for it savors of... That was on the wheel. Selfishness. Is it necessary that the terrors of the day of God should be held before us that we may be compelled to right action through fear? Do I really need to stand up here week after week and scare the whatever out of you so that you'll leave here and think, I better be a better person this week because I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to be not ready when Jesus comes. It ought not be so. Jesus is attractive. Now I'm going to get real for a minute. This week, Tracy and I went to help a woman and her two children flee from her abusive husband that she's been with for nine years because she was afraid to be anywhere else. Because he used fear to control her. Because he used fear to keep her under his domain. I have a wife who's my wife and is always home when I get home because she's terrified of me. Is that a marriage? Is that a relationship? If we don't think it's a relationship between a man and a wife, why would we think it makes a relationship that's healthy between us and God? If fear is the reason why you serve Him, you missed it. Jesus is attractive. He is full of love and mercy and compassion. He proposes... To be our friend. To walk with us through all the rough pathways of life. He says to us, I am the Lord your God. Walk with me and I will fill your path with light. Jesus, the majesty of heaven, proposes to elevate companionship with himself. Who thus, with himself, those who come to him with their burdens, their weaknesses, and their cares. He will count them his children and finally give them an inheritance of more value than the empires of kings, a crown of glory richer than has ever been known. Huh. What does he want? Does he want perfect people? No. Come with your burdens, your weaknesses, and your... Do you have those? I have those. I qualify. You see, we can't stop the darkness. We can't change the darkness. We can't prevent the darkness. Jesus said it's coming. But he said it doesn't have to come to you. You can walk with me and walk in the, in the light. How many of you think that sounds better than serving God through fear? How many of you think that's better than going to bed every night thinking, oh boy, if the stock market crashes tomorrow, I'm going to lose my house, I'm going to lose my this, and I'm going to, what am I going to do? Amen. How many of you think that sounds better than I'm such a terrible person, if anybody ever found out how bad I was, I'd have to kill myself, like the Baptist minister did this week when his name came up on Ashley Madison and people found out. Bring your burdens, bring your weaknesses, bring your cares, and he will count you his children. Satan doesn't want this message to get out. He doesn't want your friends and neighbors to know that you don't serve God because you're perfect, and you don't serve God because you're afraid. You serve God because you believe he can take the darkness and turn it into light. That he can take weakness and turn it into strength. That he can take disaster and turn it into hope. That he can take what is horrible and make it a crown of glory richer than has ever been known. So in October we will explore Judges then and now and we will learn what it is to be thriving 
in the darkness. It's coming in October. Watch for details. And in the meantime, let's sing in Christ alone. Which, as you can probably tell, is my favorite song. Father, your word says over and over again that we see, but we don't see, and we hear, but we don't hear. And Father, I'm just asking you that you help us to open our eyes and our ears so that we can see you for who you are and love you for who you are and serve you because of who you are and for no other reason. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.